right, so I don't see Maya yet, but I'm going to get started so that everyone, um, we can stick to time, hopefully. So people might still be joining, but I can just start the introductions, if that's okay with everyone. Sure. All right. Hi everyone, this is Julia Galkowitz with the National Sea Grant Office. Um, we are going to be starting soon so that we can respect your time since we know um, an hour is no small ask out of everyone's day. Um, if you are listening in, please mute yourself. I see that almost everyone is muted. Um, and if you have questions that you would like to ask, uh, we have time at the end of all of the presentations specifically for questions, so you can ask them then verbally. Uh, you also have the option to ask questions um, via the little chat box or the question box. I'll be keeping an eye on those, so if I see any questions come in, I can pose those to the presenters if you'd rather not speak or if you have a problem with your microphone. Um, all right. Recording. Everyone should be able to see my screen. Okay. Okay. Um, so it's just to do a quick introduction, since this is our very first webinar for the Sea Grant Education Network, um, these are some faces behind the voices. So I'm up at top. I am Julie Galkowitz. I work in the National Sea Grant Office. I've been here just about a year, um, and I've been working with the Education Network for that time and learning a lot from everyone. Um, Maya McGuire, who I don't think is on the line yet, um, is our chair, and she and I have been working with the Office of Education at NOAA to come up with some, some opportunities for our educators uh, to help all of you get to know each other, get to know what all of each other are working on, uh, see if we can build in some more opportunities for collaboration and, and kind of build um, the network a little stronger. Um, and very graciously helping us test a new method for that um, are our three presenters today. So that's Linda Chilton will be first. She's from USC Sea Grant. Beth Bisson will follow from Maine Sea Grant. And then Allison Eberhardt um, from New Hampshire Sea Grant will tie into Beth's presentation as well. Um, so like I said, this is a new webinar and our goal is to create a forum where the SGEN members can interact regularly on topics that include both scientific con content and professional development. So we're starting off uh, with citizen science, which is uh, scientific content, um, but also can, can be a part of professional development if you're interested in um, working on a project into a citizen science project. So we hope these webinars are going to provide a way for all of you to learn um, from each other and to help each other and perhaps develop additional collaborations and partnerships between the education programs and all of the different C grants. All right, so with that, I am going to kick it over to our first panelist, Linda. Linda, you should see an option to be the presenter now. Perfect. Okay. All right. Me. Oops. Okay. Um, I just need to hide this. Oh, we can't see it. So if oh, you, you press can't? the little orange arrow, then it hides for you, but we don't see it on your presentation. Thank you. That helps so much. Okay. Um, I. I'm really happy to be able to share with everyone a little bit about what we're doing. There's a couple of initiatives that we've been working on, and one of them is the Southern California Hab Watch, and the most recent one is the Urban Tides Community-Based Science Initiative. The history of projects and some of the, the challenges and successes, I guess, some of the lessons learned along the way. Um, please feel free to ask me questions if you have any as I go on. <clears throat> the HabWatch program was established in, in 2011, and it started when 
part of our, our COSI grant was reaching out to informal science centers and trying to make sure that we were providing them with professional development in addition to what we were doing for the formal, formal education teachers. And in talking with the different center staffs, one of the areas that they felt they didn't have a strong of knowledge was in understanding harmful algal blooms. And so we connected our scientists at USC, the Dave Karen Lab, with the informal science centers in, in having a workshop. And they shared what the results of their findings were and what they were studying and, and their methods. And then we had a chance to sit down and dialogue. And one of the issues that came up from the scientists was not having enough eyes on the water. And from the informal centers was, how do we get more involved? And so we developed a partnership and ran into probably the same issues that all of us run into over and over is, well, how are we going to pay for this? How are we going to get the equipment? How do we provide the training? And who has the time to fit it all in? Um, the commitment from everyone involved was, well, we'll make the time. And that was a, a big, giant, giant step along the way. We approached SCOOS, and they were able to give us a little bit of funding. And so our SCOOS um, gave us funding to provide, provide the equipment that each of the centers needed and to fund some graduate students to help implement the program. The combined effort of, of C grant staff and the graduate students helped identify needs and those included, in addition to the training, and this photo on the left is one of the participants on campus in the lab um, looking at and, and learning to identify the different species. Um, one, of the, one of the big needs was to have a quick guide, something that they could be able to look at and, and find most of the, the common species in our area of, of harmful algal blooms. And another request was, how do we, how do we get a sense of size? Um, so while many of them have been doing plankton workshops for years and years, none of them had really focused in on harmful algal blooms. And it was a wonderful opportunity to bring the graduate students and the researchers together to share their expertise and to develop and provide the training. Um, it, has blossomed to where not only is it through the experts, but also training for changes in staff. And that's what you see in these, the center slide and the right slide is the staff at the C-Lab. When new members of staff come on board, they train one another in what the procedures are. We do follow-up training on campus as well, and that's been really critical. The partners so far we have are from Santa Barbara at the Santa Barbara Natural History Museum Sea Center um, all along the coast down to Ocean Institute. And that includes two of the Channel Islands, both Anacapa Island with the Channel Islands National Park and National Marine Sanctuary staff, and then the Wrigley Marine Science Center at Catalina. We created a website and provided the resources that the partners would need, including the plankton ID guide and the scale guide, and, and some of the common nearshore plankton. Um, we provided training materials and taped the lectures so that when centers had participants who couldn't attend, they were able to, to follow up and watch those and see the training. Um, and then the, the next issue was, where do we host this data? How do we get it submitted, and how do we make it accessible? And initially, that was a, a significant problem. Um, we, as I said, we host the portal to the program at, at USC. But the data sets, initially, we were having it, it submitted through in Excel. And it really didn't meet the needs of the researchers or of the informal centers. And so we're really excited that we were able to move on to work with Liquid. Um, and I wanted to show you some of what it looks like. Um, Liquid is a, a database which focuses on community science or citizen science. And it ends up 
sorry, it ends up having both an opportunity to show an overview of what is available to see and also it provides charts and that was one of the big desires of the group is how can we see changes in the species that I'm looking at over time. So they can look at the individual species. Um, we also have comparisons where we can see the difference in locations. And part of the desire on doing that is to see what kinds of trends are happening, what's changing. And so we tried as we were developing the project is to be as responsive to the participants as well as to the um, researchers in getting the information that they wanted to have. Um, let's see. Oops. Let me get back to where I was. Sorry about that. Providing support to staff changes, as I mentioned, the um, centers ended up training their own staff, but we also found it was important to provide follow-up sessions at the at the university. And so we've scheduled follow-ups where staff can come in for additional training. The website initially we weren't as happy with, and we're happier, much happier with what we have now. We still are working on a mapping feature, and that has to do with the developers for the website. It's on their list, um, and hopefully that will be developed in, in a short time. The funding for expansion has been a challenge, so SCOOS gave us that initial funding. Um, and we're hoping that we'll get to a point where we will be able to expand it. So far, additional programs, as they've joined in, have been able to fund some of the components to help make it happen. And then that, that one challenge that continues, I think, to face all of us in Sea Grant is time. Um, always having enough time to be able to follow through and help support the program. Without the researchers in the Karen Lab, it wouldn't be possible to keep the program running. Um, the second project that we're working on is the Urban Tides Community Science Initiative. And it started initially with looking at the king tides and submitting photos. But as we talked to researchers, we found that they didn't have access easily to the photos on Flickr, which is where the King Tides Initiative posts their photos. It's hard to sort and be able to pull down by an area. And the students and teachers we were working with really wanted to make sure that the photos they were submitting, besides telling a story, would have an impact that they would be used. So we started a year-long effort to document the current tidal lines and, and coastal flooding. And we worked with researchers, with modelers and municipal planners to identify where there are beaches and wetland locations where photographs are needed. Um, and then use the same database that we were using with HabWatch, we were able to get a new database set up to be able to do the urban tides monitoring. Um, it initially was an education project, and again, the, the teachers and students, to me it was really powerful, and it, it says a lot about who we get to work with, because they wanted to know who's going to use this data, where is it going to go. USGS has been working with us to develop models to look at what impact sea level rise has on the 100-year storms along our coast. And so the timing was perfect. Researchers definitely identified a need and, and helped. So USGS and other researchers helped to establish the protocols. And we worked, um, Juliet Hart in our office worked diligently to make sure that the database was running smoothly and everyone went out and tested and tested and tested. And then we recruited participants. We found that just asking wasn't enough. There were a few, a small handful, but it wasn't getting the responses we needed. And we reached out to our partners at the Aquarium Collaborative that we have in Southern California as well as partners along the cities that we work with. And we saw some improvement, and we saw some with teacher professional development. We found that one of the ways where we're reaching greatest audiences is by offering Urban Tides walks and by also working with people who are already out at the beach, so who's already got a beach cleanup or a beach monitoring program. And 
as with the Urban Tides, the project is, is found on our website and the database is the Liquid Database. It's very straightforward and simple and that was one of the things we wanted to get was something where anyone could do it and going out and taking pictures at the extreme high tides and then submitting those data. Um, the outcome for us was, was has been really exciting. Planners, community members, and organizations are joining one another on walks. And the discussions that happen for a member of the community to meet one of the city planners and say, oh, it's nice to see you guys care about this. And these are other concerns I have. And to have a discussion about plans for development um, in Redondo Beach, for example. Our protocols have been adopted and adapted for consistency throughout the region and are being used by others in monitoring sea level rise. The modelers are already starting to be able to use the images and the metadata that's collected. Um, and non-formal education partners are integrating topics into their programs and discussions. So on these maps, you can see the points that are marked. Those are the points where modelers are able to are, have already started using those records and verifying the models with sea level rise. From an educator's perspective, it's inspired them by interacting with scientists and being able to be engaged in doing some of the work to help support that cutting edge research. And they really appreciate having workshops and training on local issues. One of the things that's happened is, is reports back about how they're able to integrate that into what they're teaching and passing on to classroom teachers. The scientists without question having more eyes out on the coast, giving them more data um, is always appreciated and it also enriches that for the grad students, that's a great opportunity and experience. Um, so overall, we work at, I've, I found out, I work at identifying opportunities and developing relationships, making sure that it provides relevance and to create access, and then adapting and supporting as we go along. In this photo, this was a, a 7 o'clock in the morning walk out in Malibu, looking at the urban tides and the team that was there to learn about it and pass on the information. Two of the stakeholders who were here promised to, to work with the other people along the beaches in Malibu to get a representative taking and submitting photos all along that area. Others, when they do their research in that area and do education, they're going to increase input of those photos and allow participate in MPA watch. And they also said, gosh, as long as we're walking the beach, we can plan it around these times to help make sure more data is getting supported. Next step for us will be definitely maintaining and supporting ongoing efforts, um, creating new networks for community-based science and stewardship projects and opportunities, working to refine those data products. Yes, I still want mapping. They hear me every time we talk about it. And to continue to assess the needs and provide access to training for informal educators and other members of the community. And to continue to provide avenues, um, I guess bridges, between scientists and community members to be able to communicate about science. And that's my last slide. If there's any questions. Thanks, Linda. That was great. Um, like I said, if anyone has any questions for Linda, you can feel free to ask them now. You should be able to unmute yourself by clicking the little green icon with a red slash through it next to your name. Um, and if you'd prefer to type them in, we can also, I'll, I'll be happy to read those off for Linda. So I'll give people a couple seconds to think of something to ask. Here we go. The uh, question is, what was the Git Liquid program? Um, Git Liquid is a database that, let me see if I can pull it up and show you um, from the beginning. Just a sec. Oops. Don't want to leave webinar. 
Um, it is a database, and I think I can't quite get back. Let me see if I can get back to the front end of it. No, I can't at the moment. Get Liquid um, is a group of folks who felt like it was really important to involve have a have a portal, a place to be able to put data, and they've created a variety of data sets for us. These are the four that we're using right now, um, but they've worked with researchers throughout the world and creating databases. They have incredibly reasonably rate, reasonable rates, and they have been able to work with us in, in structuring it. It's a small firm, um, but if anyone wants those specific details, I'd be happy to, to share the contacts with you if you want to just email me. that'll be useful for, for other people. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Linda. And now we will move on to our next speaker. I think that's Beth, right, Beth? Beth, I think you are muted, so if you'd like to unmute yourself, we'll be able to hear you. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I think I've shared my screen. I'm just going to go into presenting mode. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about three different programs, and unfortunately, because of that, I won't be able to go into as much detail as Linda was, which was great. Those are really cool work. Um, and so um, I am speaking on behalf of a number of other people on our team, two of whom are, are with us today on the webinar, Kristen Grant and Esperanza Stanchoff. And so I might give them an opportunity at the very end to chime in in case I miss anything. Um, and so our marine extension team is, is really the genesis and the leadership of all of these programs um, were located from Wells to in the you know near the border of New Hampshire to Eastport, which is on the border of New Brunswick, Canada. And um, Kristen is this is Kristen who um, runs the Southern Maine Beach Profile Monitoring Program. Um, this is Esperanza. She and I co-lead the. Um, our phenology monitoring program called Signs of the Seasons, and Carrie Kayser is the coordinator for the Maine Healthy Beaches program. Those are the three projects I'm going to be talking about today. And um, Esperanza was very involved in the, um, the founding of the Maine Healthy Beaches program as well. Um, and so Citizen Science at Maine Sea Grant, the extension team I just showed you a photo of is, is a very close partnership between Sea Grant at the University of Maine and the Cooperative Extension Program. And Carrie and Esperanza are, are both extension staff, and Kristen is um, jointly appointed with Extension and Sea Grant. Um, and so we have a very close working relationship um, with them, and for that reason, the programs that I'll be talking about, um, there are certain aspects of some of them that are not just coastal, so I'll share that as well. But in general, we work on water quality, the Maine Healthy Beaches program looks at water quality um, in swim beaches, coastal erosion, um, which is what the, the Southern Maine Beach Profile Monitoring Program is looking at, and climate change, um, which is phenology monitoring. And phenology, phenology is the seasonal timing of biological changes, such things as flowering and leaf out in the spring of plants, and also migration of animals, um, which is a very sensitive indicator of the local effects of global climate change. So I will jump in with the Maine Healthy Beaches program. Uh, the program is funded by the U.S. EPA. It was established as a result of the Beach Act of two, in 2000. Um, it was it was took a couple years to develop, and it was established in Maine in 2002. It's the funds are managed by the Maine Department of Environmental Protection. It's coordinated, and all the day-to-day -day work is done by um, Carrie Kayser who, as I said, is a Secret Cooperative Extension Marine Extension team member and um, other Maine Healthy Beaches staff. The purpose of the program is to monitor water quality and protect public health. 
um, and it's a very unique program around the country. It's a voluntary um, monitoring program. It's not regulatory. And so the partners are local, state, and federal agencies and so and municipalities. So you get um, the program elements are there are 29 different participants managing 59 different beach management areas. And so that's, you know, several beaches have a number of different monitoring locations. But it can be firefighters or um, state state park staff, um, lifeguards, and individual municipalities who participate choose. Um, but all of these entities are trained by CARI and staff. Um, they do trainings every single year. They're monitoring. They're using enterococci bacteria um, as a proxy for human fecal contamination, um, and so they do. They do. Um, collection of water quality samples, um, and they're all tested um, with EPA um, protocols and quality assurance. So the program basically provides the structure, quality assurance protocols, field and lab trainings, and technical assistance, and it helps communities find, fix, and prevent sources of bacterial pollution. When they have an exceedance of the standards for the bacteria, there are advisories posted at the beaches. They don't close beaches through this program, and that's a common misconception. But they're posted, and then the intensity of the monitoring is increased um, after an exceedance or after severe rain events or storms. Um, in addition to this, they also do pollution source tracking. Um, so intensified monitoring, fluorometry, fluorometry studies, pharmaceutical analysis, um, looking for those um, indicators of, of human pollution, which is why they look at pharmaceuticals, microbial source tracking, circulation studies, and other sanitary surveys. And their impacts have been really astounding over the years of the program. They're really looking at, at the end of the day to build local capacity to find, fix, and prevent water quality problems. And so some of the impacts that they've had um, are very many municipal sewer and stormwater infrastructure upgrades, which are, as we all know, are expensive, and this program helps them target specific problem areas and older systems. Um, there have been a number of new municipal stormwater management plans, um, such as in Portland, water quality ordinances of many different kinds um, pertaining to pesticide use, buffers, septic systems, etc. There's a new sewer district established in one town, boat pump out stations and recreational boater um, awareness campaigns. And they've even managed to shorten the list of impaired waters in the state. Um, there's Rockbrook and Camden as an, as an example. This model, this non-regulatory model has been adopted as well as a lot of the, um, the outreach materials and resources in Miss Michigan, Massachusetts, Washington State, California, and Oregon. Um, and so that's just kind of a brief snapshot of that project, and I will move along, but, but if you have questions on that one, maybe we can just go to the end. Um, so back to the extension team, now I'm going to talk about the Southern Maine, Marine, um, Southern Maine Beach Profile Monitoring Program, and again, that's Kristen Grant, who is based at the Wells National Estuarine Research Reserve down here in Wells. So this program was established, um, this is our oldest citizen science program, it was established in 1999 and we now have 17 years of data. Um, beach profiling is a simple surveying technique used to measure the contour of a beach and record the changes caused by seasonal and storm related erosion, which as we all know with increasing intensity of storms and increasing number of high intensity storms has become more and more of a problem, particularly um, because of the tourism value impacts on coastal areas. Um, chronic erosion leads to habitat loss, and so it's not just human impacts, but also ecological impacts we're looking at. The elements, it's a citizen science program run by volunteers. There are 15 teams, each with a leader, and they go out once a month and 12 months per year, and they target the lowest tides and they do four profile lines in each area. And so they start at the highest point and they, they go down to the beach using these two stakes um, with sight lines. It's a very simple technology to determine the difference in height is the um, 
difference in elevation of the beach. And so they established these, these vertical profiles for each of these four areas. And they, <clears throat> they, they record the days per month in, in clear skies. And so there's 17 years of data online. This is uh, the database is hosted by the C Maine Sea Grant Program. But it's really used by Maine Geological Survey and a number of other partners. Um, and more recently, in the last several years, we've developed a really exciting collaboration with NOAA National Weather Service, looking um, and established storm teams of these existing volunteers, some of whom, many of whom, I think, who've been involved right from the beginning. It's really incredible, the dedication and the generosity of time that people have given to the program. But so we've asked even a little bit more of some of these people, and they've willingly volunteered to go out before and after large storms. This is um, an image of Hurricane Sandy. Um, excuse me, this is Hurricane Joaquin, um, which didn't end up hitting us, but they were in, in place to do their monitoring. And so the goal is to improve forecasting and warning efforts. Um, we're working with John Cannon in the Gray Office of the National Weather Service. And he's also involved in some of our other research, um, secret funded research on wave runoff and um, storm impacts. So that's been a really exciting new development in this effort. And it really couldn't have happened in, except for that long-term data. I mean, the challenge of many of these projects is you don't, you don't get the recognition and the value until you've been at it for a really long time. And so this program has reached that point, and it's really exciting to us. And so, so like, I, like I said, a lot of the, the impacts associated with this program are helping to inform beach management decisions, such as beach, beach nourishment, which is very expensive. Um, and if you're just going to have your sand erode back away again, um, it doesn't make sense, or you don't want to put new sand in a place that's, uh, that's acc actually accreting sand. Um, and municipal investment in engineering studies, erosion mitigation studies, evaluation of seawalls and replacement options, dune management, restoration and fencing, um, establishment of municipal beach erosion committee in one, in one town, and then the collaboration with NOAA Weather Service, which I just mentioned. And this program has been adopted for application in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico, and it's currently being considered in California, Hawaii, Guam, and Saipan as well. Um, and so Kristen is working closely with partners in those areas um, through Sea Grant. Um, and so I will move on to the third program. Thanks for bearing with me. This is a lot of information. This is our Signs of the Seasons program. Um, as I said, it's a phenology monitoring. Phenology is the seasonal timing of biological changes. This program is a partnership with a lot of different folks. I will just point out the primary partner that we use for all of our data protocols and data management is the National Phenology Network. And so we've just fully adopted, we use their online database. Um, for their materials, but we do all of the on-the-ground work with volunteers and training. So we're, um, we're, our data are all directly comparable at the national level. But at the local level, we work with the National Park Service at Acadia National Park, Skudik Institute, um, which is at Acadia National Park as well, Coastal Maine Botanical Gardens, Maine Audubon, uh, Maine Maritime Academy, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in Maine. And then, as Allison will share in a bit, um, New Hampshire Sea Grant, University of New Hampshire Cooperative Extension have also adopted this program and she'll share how they're, how they're working with it in New Hampshire. The objective is to increase climate literacy of citizens in Maine and New Hampshire through observing and recording local effects of climate change and to contribute meaningful data to researchers and resource managers trying to understand and adapt to local effects of climate change. Um, we have 19 indicator species and these have all been chosen because of their value. Um, for, for in climate indicators, they are sensitive to changes in climate. Um, there are researchers working on understanding what's going on with these species, either as indicators or because they're very sensitive to presence or absence of other species for pollination and so forth. Um, several of them are calibration species chosen by the National Phenology Phenology Network that exist all over the country, and then they're regional plant species and intertidal species such as rockweed. Um, we have an advisor, advisory committee made up of um, representatives from the partner organizations that I just mentioned, as well as educators and climate specialists at the University of Maine. And this is the Nature's Notebook is the database run by the National Phenology Network, which is wonderful 
for us because we just don't have the capacity to do a large scale database, do all the quality control of our data, and it's just an excellent partnership for us to be able to work as a regional partner of this organization. They provide a lot of resources and webinars and so forth to our volunteers as well. We offer training resources such as um, on the ground activities and walks, um, webinars, and then support with the technical end as well as feedback and work directly with our researchers so that we can share the data that we're, that we're finding. Um, these are some of the sites. These are the sites that we have in Maine and New Hampshire using the data visualization tool in Nature's Notebook. Um, you can see we're, we're all the way throughout Maine, but very heavily concentrated along the coast, as is our population. Um, and then we're involved in a lot of research campaigns at the national and regional level. So this is one looking at the onset of breaking leaf buds in spring, um, working with the National Phenology Network looking at the, at the northeast. Um, this is timing of first leaves with um, lilacs, which are present all over the country, and so they're an excellent species for understanding the local impacts of climate change. Um, and then this is just a sense for, we, we hit, broke 400,000 total observations um, in our last, last reporting cycle. We're not, we'll have to reevaluate that for this year. But you can see it's very common, easily identified species have been our target, and, and our data show that things like American robins and red maples are, are receiving the most attention, and that because they exist everywhere um, and they're very easily identified, make them excellent candidates for this kind of program. Even though some of them um, on this list are not even native species, it's about when they're doing what they're doing, when they're flowering, um, when they're moving around, that makes them valuable. Um, and so you can see there's interannual variability, and when we're seeing things like this is the first yes for leaf out, um, I believe this is red maple, excuse me, and then this is dandelions. You can see 2012 was, a very, was an anomaly, and so that helps us educate our volunteers about things like interannual variability and then years where you have much earlier um, activity happening, you can really see that signal in the data and that's why it's so useful to build, we, we've done five seasons so far and we're looking forward to building up 17 like we have with the profiling program. Um, and then this last slide is just looking at loons. We have a new partnership with the Maine Audubon program with their dedicated loon observers trying to better understand where loons are and when they're moving around and this is kind of a neat way to visualize the data. This is the day of the year and shows that the loons are coastal or offshore um, in the, the winter, spring, and the fall, winter months, and they're inshore, they're seeing them inshore in the lakes, freshwater lakes in the summer. And so you can actually use these, this kind of graph to show how they're moving around, and that really helps managers. So that's all I had. I hope I'm not run over too much with all that information. Thanks very much for organizing this, Julia. Yeah, of course. Um, so, as before, if anyone has any questions, you can unmute yourself to ask them or type them into the chat box. We're also going to have time at the end um, to do kind of a, a more panel discussion so that you can ask questions of all three speakers or, or any questions you've thought up along the way. So, I'll pause for a second and see if anyone has any questions. Everyone's feeling shy on Tuesday, I see. All right. Um, well, if you think of anything, feel free to ask. And I am going to turn over. Uh, oh, looks like Allison is already the presenter. <laughs> there you go. All right. Allison, you should have the pop up box there. There we go. Um, and take it away. Well, hello, everyone, and good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us today. <laughs> I'd like to talk to you about a program that I coordinate called the Coastal Research Volunteers. We're a pretty young program, um, but so far I think we've got, got some good information to share. So first, a little bit of background about the program. Uh, let me just hide this. Okay, a little bit of background about the program. Um, we are the outgrowth of a very long 
long-running, multi-decade water quality mo monitoring program here in New Hampshire, where over time they realized there was a bit of a disconnect between the data that were being collected and the data needs of, in this case, the state agency that this program was organized for. So data resolution was not quite where it needed to be as instrumentation and, and data requirements were changing. Um, but there was still this very well-organized, enthusiastic group of volunteers. So with the retirement of the director of that program, uh, they gathered a bunch of stakeholders in the room together, uh, academic, researchers, state agency representatives, volunteers and had a, a revisioning session to really identify what the, the current data needs um, along the New Hampshire coast were. And so from that, the Coastal Research Volunteers, or CRV, was born. And the idea here is what I like to call a timeshare model, where really I become a citizen science coordinator for hire. And and what they identified was that there were a ton of researchers looking to engage citizen scientists, but did not have the time, the capacity, the money to do so in any sort of meaningful way. So if we had one person whose charge it was to coordinate citizen scientists, train them, mobilize them over a variety of projects, well, would this work? And so we're, we're still determining that so far. <laughs> Things do look promising. Um, as you'll, you'll see in the next few slides. So the goals of the program were twofold. So one is to provide really interesting, authentic research experiences in the field for volunteers. And then, of course, the other is to increase the capacity of our researchers to get their work done or for the managers to get the data they need. Okay, and so with the, um, the group of volunteers that we were able to carry through and then recruit some additional volunteers as well, we um, came up with a mission statement. So this is the mission that was developed by the volunteers themselves. And again, you'll see it represents that twofold objective of really meeting the, the needs and the interests of the volunteers, but then also the research community that we're gathering the data for and ideally that we're gathering the data with. And so I highlight that because what I've found in, in the three, now almost four years of CRV is that if you don't have both, um, both of those objectives being met, then that tends to be a project that's not going to be quite successful and is not going to persist. So you really need to, um, you really need to be meeting the needs of both parties, both the researchers and the volunteers. Okay, so now I'd like to just step you through a few of the projects on which we work and then um, we'll give you a few of our, our impacts to date. Now I will say I'm not going to go into too much detail because the interesting thing of this timeshare model is that every project is structured very differently. So the level of engagement of the researcher, the level engage of um, of data collection of the volunteer, where the data are housed, how the data are reported back varies from project to project. So please do feel free to follow up with me in the time afterward or um, after the webinar if, you have, if you're interested in information on any of these specific projects. Um, also, you'll see that our partners vary. So this first partner is a, is a private entity. This is the only one um, of this kind with which we work. So this is a local golf course that's looking to get a certification as a um, habitat sanctuary. As part of that certification process, they needed to meet both a water quality monitoring and an outreach and engagement goal. So they um, contacted me and we started to work together. They pay um, modest support for my salary as well as the uh, the water quality sample analysis, and uh, we engage both the adult volunteers, typically adult volunteers of the Coastal Research Volunteer Program, as well as a sixth grade class from a local school to collect uh, water quality data and then benthic macroinvertebrate data as indicators of the stream health of a stream that's running directly through the golf course. We've been working on that project for three years now. We've worked with two years worth of students and an exciting extension of this project is that based on the student and volunteer collected data, 
we identified high nitrogen and phosphorus loads and high sediment loads to the stream. And uh, we're able to get a grant funded to restore a riparian buffer working with the golf course. So we are now doing that. We've got the students that as sixth graders collected benthic macroinvertebrates now coming out to work on us to implement the management action that their data called for. So they'll be coming out with us in the spring to help um, restore a buffer along stretches of this stream. Uh, we're also working with the adult volunteers as well. We conducted stream surveys um, and management practices, both for this course and then to hopefully extend to other golf courses in New Hampshire. A second project is a partnership with New Hampshire Fish and Game. Uh, this occurred as because for the stock assessment for the American eel, the Atlantic State Marine Fisheries Commission, who's charged with regulating the uh, American eel fishery here on the East Coast, um, they recommended that each state that has, that supports American eels, um, monitor the ingress, the movement upstream from the coast into freshwater of young of the year, so um, one year or younger, uh, American eels, so glass eels or elvers. And Fish and Game in New Hampshire is a woefully underfunded agency and was only able to monitor at one location. And so working with the coastal research volunteers, they're now able to monitor the, the minimum that the Atlantic State Marine Fisheries Commission recommends, so that is a minimum of two sites. So the coastal research volunteers are fully staffing one site, so that's daily monitoring on the weekdays, five days a week. We've got a minimum of two volunteers out there collecting the glass seals, anesthetizing them, measuring them, um, assessing their pigmentation level, um, making sure they're, they revive happily, and then, and then putting them back in the stream and getting um, eel counts as well. And so these data are going to fish and game and then feeding into the stock assessment that's done by the Atlantic State Marine Fisheries Commission. We are also working with the New Hampshire chapter of the Nature Conservancy as well as researchers at the Jackson Estrin Laboratory here at UNH as part of their oyster reef restoration efforts in Great Bay. Uh, our volunteers will assist in cleaning shell. They have a shell recycling program. They also are part of a habitat suitability effort where um, it's an extension of another citizen science effort that coordinated by the Nature Conservancy where dock owners are growing oysters throughout the bay. And so our volunteers help in monitoring the size of the oyster spat, the young oysters on the shell, collect data on growth over time, collect data on survival, and then those oysters are then deployed as part of the restoration effort. So it's giving our researchers a very good sense of the, the really prime areas within the bay um, for oyster growth and really helping inform both great places for rearing the oysters as well as deploying them for restoration. We are also taking part in some sand dune restorations throughout efforts throughout the coast of New Hampshire and northern Massachusetts. Um, these efforts involve a lot of planting and fencing. There's also some, an experimental component where volunteers are collecting data, looking at elevation change, dune profiles similar to the habitat profiling that um, Beth and the folks in Maine are doing. Um, also some experiments looking at plant diversity and, and the ability of diversity of plants and different plant assemblages to increase coastal resilience. So a lot of opportunities for citizen science here. We're finding that this project in particular we've taken into the schools and have started developing a curriculum around it. It's fitting quite nicely with um, particularly I think it's a fifth grade uh, next generation science standards. Um, we're working in Plum Island with if any of you are familiar with Plum Island. It's a very um, it's a topic that's very much on the local residents' radar. So the schools are very, very interested in these issues of coastal erosion as, as some of the houses have been falling into the ocean as 
um, nor'easters come their way. And so it's something that the community has really embraced these projects and we're able to mobilize large numbers of school children out in our stewardship and data collection efforts as part of this project. Uh, we've also worked with the Nature Conservancy to conduct fish surveys in a creek that's tributary to Great Bay in New Hampshire. Uh, this serves as a pre-restoration baseline. They're enlarging the culvert. The engineering work has just been done. But they had no real sense of um, which resident nor migratory fish communities were really were using this system. And so coastal research volunteers went out, collected a series, did a series of fish collection efforts using seines, minnow traps, um, collected water quality data. The report has just come out um, on the baseline fish community at Lubberland, Lubberland Creek in Newmarket, New Hampshire. And then the hope is that once the restoration has been complete, we'll go out and collect the post-restoration monitoring data as well. And then as Beth mentioned, um, Beth and Esperanza have graciously donated a, a lot of their time to help bring the Signs of the Season program here to New Hampshire. Um, we are implementing it in New Hampshire in a couple of different ways. We have kind of the general monitoring um, where um, volunteers can choose the species that they most want to monitor, but we, we also are working on some more focused efforts similar to what Beth mentioned, um, training volunteers to get out as part of a, a focused project looking at the phenophases of rockweed. Uh, we've also got a project that we're bringing into the schools where we're going to be training students, uh, middle school age students, to collect phenology data of native salt marsh species. Um, and so that's coming online in just a few months. And so now just, um, I'll try to wrap it up. I just took a look at the clock. I will, uh, <laughs> um, a few of the, the impacts that we've seen in just three years so far, the coastal research volunteers have assisted in, in researchers in establishing over 15 acres of oyster reefs, a horseshoe crab monitoring project that I, I didn't mention today, but our citizen scientists collected over 50% of the data for a, um, research project that was led at the University of New Hampshire. So we more than doubled the data that these researchers were able to get by engaging citizen scientists. Uh, to date, we've been collecting eel data for three years, and we have counted more than 25,000 of those little wiggly glass eels. <laughs> um, and here, just from the words of one of our, our partners, um, you can get a sense of, of the um, impact that we're, we're hopefully making to, to researchers and how they're starting to value us as a resource. And then in terms of impacts to the volunteers, every year we do an annual s a survey to our volunteers to gauge um, their knowledge gained and, and the impact of our programming on them and also to help us inform next steps and improve our programming. Um, and so far in three years, you can see that it appears the volunteers are, are we are providing some, some good educational opportunities for them. And then again, here are some of their, our volunteers' own words. And then I think the last thing I'd like to do, just I have a slide about um, benefits and challenges, but I think what I'll do is just go to my very last slide where I've got a few resources, so that'll allow us at least a few minutes for discussion. Um, two resources I'd like to point you to. One is a tip sheet on working with citizen science volunteers that uh, the Stewardship Network New England generated. That's a organization housed here at the University of New Hampshire through Cooperative Extension. Any of you in northern New England, I, I highly encourage you to check it out as a resource for advertising your citizen science projects or volunteer-based projects, and also as a resource for getting support on developing a project. Um, for those of you a bit further away, the Stewardship Network hasn't quite come to you yet. It's localized to New England right now, but there are some really great resources there like this one. The last thing I'll mention is that the Citizen Science Association is also a great resource and um, currently has free membership, so certainly something 
that I recommend looking into um, and joining. It, there's some really great resources to be had, and it is um, citizen science is certainly growing in leap, leaps and bounds. Um, so, uh, with that, I think I will stop and and allow some time for questions. Thanks so much, Allison. That was great. Um, so again, if anyone has any questions specifically for Allison, feel free to ask them now. But if you also have any questions you'd like to direct to the entire panel, to all of our speakers, um, please feel free. I, I have a list of questions that I would like to ask, but I'd like to give everyone else a chance first. All right, well, please type in questions if you have them, but I will go ahead and ask some questions. Um, I'm going to unmute all of our panelists, so Beth and Linda, I've just unmuted both of you. Um, so one of my questions, and, and Beth, you kind of, or Allison, you just kind of touched on this, is um, evaluation. So coming, checking with people to see if, if this is worth it, both for scientists and for the people participating. And I'm wondering that uh, in light of, do you, do you ever have to justify putting together these citizen science projects um, to your superiors, or do they already value it, and does the evaluation you do help you uh, to justify that? Well, this is Allison. I'll, I'll start with this one. Um, so, I mean, I had I was fortunate in that I was hired as a, the citizen science coordinator. So, as CRV started to take off, that's when they created my position and hired me. So, in terms of my immediate supervisors, there was clearly within the institution a focus on and value of citizen science. Um, that said, I will say that evaluation, the data we're collecting are very critical in terms of the funding allocations, both internally and externally, as well as, um, I think, continued justification for it. So, you know, as I mentioned, we're, we're heading into year four, so there was probably some degree of, okay, the, I think particularly with this timeshare model, let's see, let's see if it works. But, I think any temporary aspect of the of the vision is is very quickly brushed aside, and and we're proving CRV to be um, an effective model based on our evaluation data. And on the topic of evaluation, because I know I have no social science background whatsoever, um, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology has a citizen science toolkit and a really great document on evaluation of citizen science programs where in, as part of my evaluation I just grabbed questions straight from there. I mean, I, ideally you have a social science scientist you can be working with, but knowing that many of us are resource limited, um, there is a really great resource on the Cornell Lab of Ornitho Ornithology website that you can use to help craft and, and create your survey. Excellent. Um, Beth or Linda, do you have anything? Um, I'll just add that we also have used um, some of those those questions um, where they seemed relevant, or we, we have um, worked with social scientists at the University of Maine also to develop questions that are targeted for the kind of outcomes that we're trying to achieve through the program. We certainly haven't had any um, challenges in terms of our program leadership um, has always been very supportive of these efforts, and they've been driven by, um, well, by the Beaches Act in the case of the Maine Healthy Beaches, but also by the communities um, that really need the data. Um, and then the Science of the Seasons program is a really wonderful, I mean, um, educators and citizens, I think, struggle to understand the local realities of change uh, through climate change, and it's just been a wonderful way to help people see and understand how those local realities change, particularly since a lot of the data that you get on climate are at the regional or global scale, and this really makes it accessible. And we see that in our evaluations, people report they feel increased confidence in, in speaking about climate change and um, getting involved in other efforts as well. Excellent. Linda, anything to add? I, I think both Beth and Allison did a great job of covering it. Great. Okay, so we have a question from the audience, and I will read it verbatim. Um, funding, funding, funding. How do we obtain it to work on these fantastic projects? I'm particularly interested in the Phenology Network. 
So, where do you guys get your money from? <laughs> Um, we are very creative. We're fortunate that Sea Grant and Cooperative Extension are core funded. And so, to be honest, Esperanza and I, it's a labor of love in a lot of ways to get this going. Um, we have found small amounts of grant funny money, um, particularly through collaboration with our partners. Having the national network there um, is excellent. There's no way we could afford to do that kind of sophisticated database. Um, unless we spend all the available time we have writing grants, and even then, I'm not sure. Um, but it's it's an ongoing challenge for sure. Um, it's an absolutely an ongoing challenge, and we've we have a um, a seasonal coordinator that joins us, and we've been able to scrape together funding for that. But we're always looking for opportunities um, and grants. It's, it's the trouble, as I'm sure many of you are aware, it's really hard to find funding for very long term efforts that are not going to go away, and we don't want them to go away. Yeah, and I, I think I mean, it's the same for us is that it's it's grant funding and it's figuring out ways to make it fit because you know that it's the right thing to do. Um, there's definitely support, but without the funding it makes it tough. Um, and sometimes you know partner organizations are willing to pick up some of those costs of buying the equipment um, to help oversee their site. So it's it's a whole. I guess it's that flexibility of trying different things, but going after grants is a big part of it. And I'll just add too that actually the municipalities partnering on the Southern Maine Beach Profile Monitoring Program are kicking in funding every single year for that program, and we've been able to keep that commitment from them, um, which has helped sustain it. I will say one challenge that I've been dealing with in terms of our timeshare model is there seems to be an impression amongst some researchers that you use volunteers because they're free. And so when I approach them and say, great, well, I will co coordinate the volunteers. I will be in charge of your QA, QC. I will train them. Um, and, they, and they're expecting volunteers to be free. They're very reluctant to pay for my time. So, um, there seems to be a disconnect there, this understanding that, you know, well, you're not paying them a salary, but there is time, it's a huge time investment to really meaningfully engage citizen scientists. And so what that has meant is that, like Beth and like Linda have said, we're very much funding these projects via grants, which means I'm spending a lot of time writing grants. I'm becoming the PI on many of these, and so now I'm organizing these projects soup to nuts, what, which is not sustainable. We're fortunate in that I think we have brought in enough money that we'll be able to hire someone, but there's no security there, as, as you all know, with grant funding. And so that continues to be a huge challenge for us. But right now, it's primarily grant funding that, that supports these projects. Interesting. Good input. Thanks. Um, I have another question from the group. Uh, what trouble have you encountered with researchers trusting the data collected by volunteers, and how do you reassure researchers that the data is valid or validate the data? Yeah, for the work that we're doing right now, the researchers are the ones who are, who are looking at it and we're together talking about how can we validate that, and so of adding images of the Plankton for HabWatch. It's not just the data that's input, but images to match against that and to make sure that quality is, it, it can be assured. Um, with the, the urban tides, it's something that mo much of the data is automatically recorded, and so the researchers are feeling, I mean, the metadata is recorded on your cell phone when you take that picture or from your camera, it can be uploaded um, and you're feeling very confident with it. It seems to be often though that that question does come up, um, that people are reluctant or hesitant and building that into the training of how do we make certain that the quality is at the standard that it needs to be is really important. I think perceptions are changing on that. Um, with more and more um, visibility for the the outcomes and the, what citizen science programs can do, particularly from this this administration, and at the um, federal level within various agencies. And I think 
that in our case, um, both you know rigorous quality assurance protocols, and then also working where we're developing new programs, working with the researchers um, collaboratively, co collaboratively to help design the protocols that they're comfortable with from the outset, so that we're not, um, you know, the, we just have buy-in from them from the beginning. Yeah, and I'll echo what Beth said about really trying to get in there early to discuss and possibly adapt methods to, to make sure that they're appropriate for citizen scientists. I've worked with a few researchers where we've determined this is not a good fit for citizen science, whether it be you know available resources or the complexity of the protocol or um, you know the scale of the sampling they're trying to achieve. And so I think kind of first vetting that and having some sort of decision framework in the beginning for understanding whether it's a good fit for citizen science and and scientists. And then, um, as Beth and Linda said, working with the researcher to develop a protocol and then. Um, you know, have a QA, QC process in place that everyone's comfortable with. I also think getting the researchers out in the field occasionally with the citizen scientists so that they can be there working with them is, is tends to benefit both parties as well. The citizen scientists really seem to love having a resource available to answer all their questions in the field, and then this hopefully gives the researchers some assurance of, of the abilities of the citizen scientists to collect repeatable data. Oh, I so agree with that, and it, I mean, it brings up discussions that wouldn't happen otherwise, um, both from the researcher and from the, the citizen or community-based scientists. So finding and making that time is invaluable. And I'd also emphasize um, ongoing communication with the researchers on the protocols themselves, too, because um, it's been wonderful to have those interactions and also to you know, if we find that volunteers are getting confused, uh, being able to check in with the researchers with whom we've worked um, and have them field questions and respond directly to volunteers, it's been, it's been an excellent experience, I think, on both sides so that there's a better understanding of what citizen scientists can do and what they cannot do, um, both for this, these programs and for the future efforts. Thank you. Um, since we are a little past 4 o'clock, I want to be mindful of everyone's time. So I think we can wrap up the panel unless anyone has any last input. Um, I want to thank you guys so much. This has been very helpful, you know, how we get started, general resources for people to use, um, where to get some, some questions for evaluation and to work with social scientists, and, you know, kind of the challenges that you've run into. Um, as you've as, as you've all put together these programs, um, even you know determining if a project is good, a good fit or not for citizen science. So this has been fantastic. Um, I have this webinar recorded, so we'll be able to post it to a uh, YouTube page, um, so everyone can watch it if they would like uh, on their own. And then I am going to just quickly. Um, take back the presentation. So, um, like I said, these webinars, the goal here is to make sure that everyone is, is learning and getting things out of uh, the webinar. I'm not just doing this to, to take up an hour of your month. Um, so, what topics, uh, I'd, I'd ask you all and give you the charge of what topics can you present on? Um, we're not just looking for bright, shiny successes, but also the challenges in learning from failure. Um, too often, I think we've learned in science, failure is not reported so that we keep repeating um, in different places the failures, um, whereas we could be learning from them and sharing them as well. Um, I'd also love to hear about collaborations that you've already set up between the Sea Grant educators in the different states and uh, the things that you're working on now. So keep that in mind. Our next webinar will be in March. We're looking for the, on the third Tuesday every other month, if you can remember that pattern. Um, and so I will be starting to look for uh, uh, some more topics as time goes on. Um, but for now, I would just like to say thank you to all of our panelists, Linda, Beth, and Allison. And thank you to everyone else for uh, joining us. 
Um, and unless there are any final questions, I'll give you like 10 seconds to type them in or say them. Um, I think we can say goodbye and happy Tuesday. Thanks so much, Julia, for all your work on this. Oh, I'm happy yeah, to help. You, Julia. I'm learning about everything that we're talking about, so this is fantastic for me. It's really my professional development. <laughs> All right, well, with that, I think we can end the webinar, and thanks, everyone, for joining us. Goodbye. Bye-bye.